Tonight we're going to look at sensation and perception, vision. This is unit two of our continuation of a look at biological processes um, and basis of behavior and vision plays a key role in sensation and perception. In fact, um, vision is the strongest of the senses, the one that humans typically use the most. So when we're looking at vision, we have to keep in mind that um, this is the one that, you know, there's going to be more information here um, and potentially much more uh, possibility for AP students that this would be on the AP test because vision is one of those key areas because it's going to, if it's such a strong sense for people, it's going to form the basis for um, how they understand their world, how they act in it, and the behaviors that are produced from that. So let's take a, take a look here. We only use light energy to see. And it's light energy that really gives us um, the ability to see the world around us. But as we've mentioned in class and talked about quite a bit, it's not exactly the world as it is. Um, we only see a very small sliver of the wide spectrum of, of potential and possible light. So from gamma rays, x-rays, ultraviolet rays, infrared, radar, broadcast bands, and AC circuits, and we can't see those um, at all. And we just see within that kind of a rainbow um, that we're sort of used to, those colors that make up our world. It would be, it would be interesting to say like, what other colors could there be? Um, it seems like our human experience, we just know the rainbow of colors, but could there be potentially other ways of seeing? And that's a tricky, maybe trippy thing to think about, but let's look at a really simple thing that will help to determine um, how we see light and how we uh, see the world. So there's a rainbow. I remember this pretty clearly. We were coming back from um, South Padre Island and uh, we were probably just about an hour from uh, Houston coming south, uh, going into Houston, maybe getting closer to Sugar Land, I guess. So um, it was raining off in the distance to the east and we were on the highway and Mrs. Duas was driving and I was like, wow, look at that rainbow. <laughs> I had like one of those double rainbow moments. And you've probably seen one, you know, somewhere where you've just been like amazed. Like I remember pulling over on the side of the road when my son was really little. He can just barely understand what he was seeing. And I pulled him out and showed him it was the first rainbow he'd ever seen. I was like, wow, look at that. That's awesome. So leprechaun wise, I'm not going to get into that, but maybe we will in March. Um, what makes up a light wave? This is a really good way of, of looking at it because we see a rainbow, most of us understand at this point in our lives, that the rainbow that we're seeing is not exactly like something that is there. You know, it's not um, actually uh, out there in, in the world. And what we're seeing is made up of um, the light that's being reflected. So the sun's sunlight is being ref reflected, refracted, and then there's this total internal reflection, which is happening within um, the drops of, of water and rain. And then we're getting a dispersion as well. So what we see, what a man sees, a rainbow at, with red at the top and blue at the bottom. And let's just check it out. Is, is that what we see with red at the top and blue at the bottom? Yes, we do. Red at the top, bluish at the bottom, kind of a yellow in the middle. Um, so isn't it interesting to see how that works, how the rays are being kind of um, changed and altered, and then we see this phenomenon. It's pretty amazing, really. Um, and there's a, maybe a better way of looking at it, where you can see how the red, green, and blue, it's just the angle, it's the way in which they are reflected. It's got to be pretty, it just doesn't happen when the sun's out and there's a little bit of rain has to happen in a specific angle and way. So you could see a rainbow from one side of town, but maybe the other side or another area wouldn't see it or understand it as well. Let's talk about how we see um, light 
as, as wavelengths. So the distance from one peak of a, of a light wave to the next peak is what we call wavelength. And the wavelength, wavelength determines, the distance there determines the hue of the light we perceive. And hue is color. So there's the distance between those two peaks. That's the wavelength. So if the wavelength is very short or very long, it'll change the hue or the color. And it just depends upon, you know, I guess it's going to depend upon, you know, what type of wavelength you're getting. That's going to give you the color. So a short wavelength with a high frequency um, is going to give you bluish colors, high pitched in sounds. And that's important to remember. We'll talk about hearing in the next video. And so when we talk hearing, we're also dealing with waves, um, wavelengths. At the bottom, of course, is the sky and then the ocean below it. And you've got a lot of blue there, mostly because of the light reflecting. But what we're seeing reflected back towards our eyes is, um, is that same kind of a wavelength. A long wavelength with low frequency gives us the reddish or low pitched sounds, as we'll see later. So you see there a rose, and I'm sure it smells. Um, as a rosewood, um, we'll get to, we'll get to smell and taste some too in the next video. Let's look at the different colors here. You've got red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet, and you can see the different lengths of the wavelength and the different peaks. Um, the intensity or brightness that we get from a color, because you know it can kind of change in hue, is dependent upon the amount of energy in a light wave. So the amount of energy in a light wave is determined by the height of the wave and the higher the wave the more intense the light is. Um, I, I really liked the all red uniforms. Red helmet, red jersey, red pants, I mean that seemed to me like to be an intense color combination for our eagles. Um, of course we don't have that anymore at this point but um, so you've uh, you got a little less intense blue down there at the bottom. Red is a, an, in, an intense color typically. The more intense the light is, the higher the wave, the wavelength. Let's just look at the minds. I hear a really good quote by uh, Buckminster Fuller. I just want that to be called Buckminster. I think that's a pretty cool name. Um, we only see that, and his quote was, everything we see is inside of our own heads. And I think that's a really good way to consider the perception of the world around us. And we're recreating it or re we're experiencing it and perceiving it in a way, as we talked in the last video, what perception and sensation are. But our mind, our brain is creating the world around us. It's very important to understand. As we'll talk about psychological disorders and um, uh, issues and problems with, with people who are dealing with psychological issues and um, some types of disease like depression, that sort of thing. People are kind of getting the same information, potentially, the same sensory information, but what they're doing with it inside of their own mind is, is quite different. So, white light through the prism. A prism breaks white light into its component colors or spectrum. You can see the spectrum at the top. White light, the first prism breaks light into its spectrum. The, a screen lets only one color pass through. So a second prism only changes the light's direction. Sometimes we look at prisms and um, it's a way to kind of look at the light waves and create that rainbow effect. Um, great amplitude gives us bright colors. Smaller amplitude, duller colors. Now, when I was looking at the prism and the colors here, it made me think a little bit about the, uh, the great Pink Floyd album, The Dark Side of the Moon. And um, you may have heard of The Dark Side of the Rainbow. And this is, uh, it says Halloween weekend here, November 1st, 2013. Um, and that's coming up. Actually, I could go to that if I wanted to, uh, November 1st, at the Austin Music Hall. Um, three hours of live music, The Dark Side of the Moon in its entirety. Um, cost costume contest. And it's at the website, thedarksideoftherainbow.net. That's interesting. I'll have to pull it up and look at it. I hadn't read the fine print there. So this is the idea that 
um, and it's interesting and you can see this for yourself if you click on the link um, here but if you've seen the Wizard of Oz before um, you may have also noticed that with the Wizard of Oz um, there is uh, let me flip back here uh, it's covering it up a little bit let me read it to you Aphonesia Aphonia, sorry, is the experience or seeing meaningful patterns or connections in random or meaningless data. So, um, let's see if I said that right. The experience of seeing meaningful patterns or connections in random or meaningless data. A lot of people, when you play the movie, um, The Wizard of, the Oz, Wizard of Oz, and about the third line's roar, as the, the line roars for the third time, the M-Gem line at the beginning, you start the album, The Dark Side of the Moon, which is um, quite an experience on its own. And some have argued that the Dark Side of the Rainbow phenomenon, where the movie syncs up with the album, is just the mind playing tricks on itself. It's an example of this, where the observer will focus on events in the movie that are accompanied by changes in tempo or sudden shifts in the intensity of the music, but you ignore other events in the movie and changes in tempo on the album that do not correspond to anything. And I think most people would say, yeah, that's probably what's going on here. And I did for a long time, and I've seen some like short snippets of it, but I never sat and did this. And the other night I did, and really interesting to see. I mean, I, I thought I was like going to see a few instances. It seemed like every major scene change, there was a change in the song. It is really remarkable, very, very interesting, and the pacing and mood of the music kind of matches the pacing and the mood and the scene and the settings of the movie, I, it, or the, the album and the movie, I'm not sure if I said that right. Interesting quote here by Nick Mason, the Pink Floyd drummer in 1997, he said, this is absolute nonsense, it has nothing to do with The Wizard of Oz, it was all based on the sound of music. So there you go. I mean, I don't know, I mean, maybe the guys in the band got together or whoever wrote the majority of the songs or the music that went with it got together and decided they were going to do it with this I, I mean it's possible but they'll probably never say that it is I think it's just neat to see but the, the Pink Floyd The Dark Side of the Moon oh that's no moon that's a Star Wars reference for you maybe you get that maybe you don't if you don't whatever so let's talk about saturation and just with The Dark Side of the Rainbow something to think about here is it just, you know, our sensations bringing in a movie, vi visuals. If you've seen The Wizard of Oz, you have an emotional connection to it probably of some kind or some way, if you like it or whatever. And definitely the, the music from Pink Floyd, um, The Dark Side of the Moon, is an emotional um, album. It's, it's, there's all, there are all kinds of things going on in that thing. So maybe there's a way to, that we're just making sense of it by watching it in tandem together. Uh, but <laughs> I'm just, I challenge you to you get a few minutes, like it's 40 minutes of your time. I challenge you to sit down and do it and see what you think. Let me know what you think because I think it's it's almost like too coincidental to be uh, real. Maybe I just like conspiracies or something. I'm not sure. Anyway, back to saturation here. If the human eye was not responsive to differences in the purity of light waves, we would not be able to perceive the differences in saturation of color. So everything would kind of look similar but we can see differences in the purity of the light waves and so you get like a b c and d a difference in the saturation or the you know the brightness or darkness let's talk about how this turns um the uh the light that we're sensing into the ability for our brain to perceive it and that's called transduction the conversion of one form of en energy to another and frankly in every one of our senses we're doing that whether it's sight smell touch taste or hearing um, sight smell touch taste or hearing that's all five and dead people it's different how is this important when studying sensation well i think it's massively important to understand that there's uh, going to be a transfer of the stimulus energy to neural impulses. So we looked at this inside the neuron with the electrical to chemical stimulation. In the system transduction, when it occurs, the environmental energy, like light, is then transformed into electrical or neural energy. So the receptor cells, which we'll talk about in length here in a minute, are going to produce an electrical change 
in response to a physical stimulus. For example, light energy trans, uh, transmits to uh, vision, and chemical energy, smell and taste, sound waves to sound. So hopefully, this is really where, you know, in, in, my, in my mind, the way I think of this, this is where the magic happens. How in the world this happens is, is amazing. And, and the theory that we're just a bag of neurons kind of comes into play here. The amazing ability of the neuron to do what it does and all of them to work together to create the experience that we have. It's pretty, pretty startling when you think about it. But the structure of the eye, let's look at the pieces, the parts that make up um, the ability to have some vision. So you've got the uh, iris, lens, pupil. Let's look at those three first. The pupil is your adjustable opening at the center of the eye. And you know that. I'll look at you real quick here. See, there's my pupil. I'm, I'm showing my, pup my pupils, my, my pupil, this is strange. The iris is the ring of muscle that forms the colorized portion of the eye around the pupil and controls the size of the pupil opening. So you know how this works. If you go to the eye doctor and you get your pupils dilated, which means they open up real big, and I hate that. It drives me crazy. Every time I go, I say, I'm never getting that done again. And I always do it. I'm like afraid maybe there's something wrong with my eye. And it's good to do because when it's dilated, they'll be able to look into your eye much clearer and see if there's any kind of irregular, uh, irregularities or deformity. But still, it just takes seems like it takes forever for your pupils to come back to, to normal when you get them dilated like that. Um, the, so the iris is that ring of muscle, and you know how that works. When you're outside and there's a lot of light, well, that's going to um, close down, isn't it? Because you don't need to let as much light in. When you're inside and it's almost dark, it's going to open up as far as it can. It's almost like um, similar to uh, a camera's lens opening or closing. But the lens and the eye is different. That's the transparent structure behind the pupil that changes shape to focus images onto the retina. And you can see it here, there's a candle on that side, okay, and as it goes through, the light's coming through the eye, on the back of the retina, it is a flipped image, and we've talked about this some in class. That is going to be on the central point of focus there, the phobia, which we'll, a fovea, which we'll talk about here in a second. And then the optic nerve is gonna take that information in through those neurons. Let's look at the cornea next. The cornea, is the transparent outer covering of the eye. And if you've ever heard of someone like tearing or scratching their cornea, that can be really uh, a bad situation. It, it's hard for that to heal sometimes. You get a scratched cornea, it can be even kind of painful and irritating. The retina is in the back of the eye there, and it contains these sensory receptors, which we're going to talk about at length in a couple minutes. The fovea is that point of central focus where the image is being focused, hopefully correctly. Um, and then the optic nerve is that pathway to the brain's visual cortex. So it'll go all the way through the visual cortex and it passes through a few things on the way. The blind spot is where the optic nerve leaves the eye with no receptors. And that's pretty simple. I'll point with it here with the mouse with the arrow. It's right there in the center. So you're not going to see um, anything that's right there being projected against it. So um, here is another way of looking at it. So you've got the iris pupil, cornea, and lens, and that flower is being then sent through the eye. The image is flipped the way the lens works and shown on the retina. Now, what's amazing is your brain kind of pulls that image back and makes right the world for you, so you know it's not upside down. But that's, some again, where some of the magic is happening. So let's look at the difference between nearsighted and farsighted. Nearsighted, and this is a term that you know, I'm not really focusing on it for our test especially, but like you could see this on the AP test for sure, and it could be in an AP question that we've pulled off AP tests that uh, maybe you'll see in your test here, or potentially at the end of the year when we do the mock AP test, definitely for the AP test. So myop myop myopia is uh, the other term for nearsightedness, where nearby objects are seen more clearly than distant objects. Now why is that? You can see it on the diagram here. The eye is elongated, and the image will then focus before it hits the retina. So it, it looks blurry. It's not right. If you're nearsighted, um, nearby objects are seen clearly, and that's what I am. I'm nearsighted. I can see things up close pretty well without my glasses. But if I'm looking across the room, when I put my glasses on, I look across the room, 
it's taking the light in here it's changing it so that it's going to hit the back of my retina at the right spot and correct it. and I'll talk more about that here in just a second um, farsighted is the opposite it's um, hyperopia hyper hyper and so the far away objects are seen more clearly than near, way, near objects are and you'll see this with people sometimes where they'll have a uh, something that they're trying to read and if it's close they can't see it so they'll hold it out here and oh then it comes into to vision they can see it pretty well well I've always been nearsighted and not farsighted I couldn't see far away objects very well so my eyes were kind of like the one on the left there nearsighted nearby objects are seen more clearly than distant objects well last year around this time and I went pretty much the, a year without getting this fixed because I was like I wasn't sure if it was just an MS thing or, or what but and I wasn't really considering or thinking that I was 42 then I'm 43 now so that I would be needing bifocals which is what this has right here and you can't see them because they're sort of like I don't know what you call um, transitional so they're much like the the ED trifocal zones there so the top of my lens is distance and the middle is intermediate and at the bottom is nearsightedness so if I am reading I can look at this right here and I can see it very well and hold it up if I'm doing this it's it's harder for me to read especially if it's smaller so this kind of fixes that Benjamin Franklin's the guy that came up with this idea of bifocals I wish I didn't have to have it so why do I have it well when you get to be about 40 or so this can be an issue for some people and I would say a lot of people unfortunately where the lens of the eyes becomes progressively less flexible and it has trouble accommodating to focus on objects at different distances um, it seems to me maybe I'm crazy maybe it's the way it looks but people who do an awful lot of reading they're reading big huge books here and they're uh, looking at uh, really small print um, maybe that's the issue now what I was noticing was I would read a book like this and then I would look up and I my vision was a mess I couldn't get it corrected and part of that is the same reason that I need the bifocal is my lenses um, were less flexible and had trouble accommodating here I thought it might be something with the optic nerve and maybe that's an issue with my MS now we mentioned this in class with biological basis of behavior and multiple sclerosis that it's a degeneration of nerves and um, where it can be destroyed over time the optic nerve is just the same as anything else in the brain or central nervous system a series of neurons that are communicating this is a really kind of a gross picture here but it gives you kind of a cutaway image look at what and I did this for a reason here you're seeing the structure and the strength of the eye muscles your eye muscles are incredibly strong and they move and adjust and uh, are constantly working when you're awake and even when you're asleep as we'll find in the next unit but I wanted to come back to this point to let you know you know maybe that's the strength of the muscles um, that have pulled or tightened in certain ways that have created this diff different shape of the eye and that's what sometimes will cause nearsightedness or farsightedness so that's another thing to consider and think about let's, let's talk blind spot and blind sight because we've mentioned blind spot now this is kind of similar it's the same term anyway that you'd have when you're driving and some of you who are just starting to learn how to drive need to really consider this part it could save your life um, the image of the two cars along the side of this um, gold car gray car whatever um, I don't like if I'm driving I don't like to be uh, in a spot where there are cars in my blind spot now I'll try to like speed up or slow down to avoid that from happening because the driver can't see them very well you've got the rear view mirror which is going to give you the ability to see behind you like down this direction but you're not going to see where it's gray so as these cars pass into your blind spot it's very difficult to see if they're going to pull in front of you or or what they're going to do the blind spot in your eye is very different okay it's the location in the retina where the visual cortex exits to the brain and there are no visual receptors there 
So you don't notice the blind spot in everyday life because your brain is amazing, covers up for this. Your two eyes kind of work in tandem to cover it up, and your brain fills in the missing pieces of information based upon what it estimates to be there, which is fantastic. I mean, that's an amazing thing. It just shows you how the brain itself is creating the world around you in such a fantastic way. Now, there are problems with this because when you're having a blind spot issue, there could be a temporary adjustment or you could see something that's not there for a second. We're going to do a couple tests on that here in a second. But blind sight is something different. That's something I asked about this summer at Rice University with a professor there who um, teaches psychology. And I asked about this because this is one of the things that I was really confused about. How can you be blind physically and you can't you cannot see but it says in this definition we can see things we don't perceive well it's because the stimulus is getting through the brain but there's a problem in the visual cortex or somewhere in the brain where you're unable to um, know that your eyes are working so it's not functioning along the visual system there but your eyes are functioning correctly you're bringing in visual information as we're going to discuss here, it passes through the brain, but at some point it gets tripped up and it doesn't finish, and you really have no awareness that you can see anything. Yet people will be able to avoid objects as they walk. If someone's blind, blind sighted, means they're blind, but they can they can see and um, kind of perceive things. Now they don't perceive it, but they can sense it. Like if a person's blind, you can put them in front of a can uh, front of a screen and they're looking but they don't see anything it's totally blind and then they're seeing pictures if there's a person crying you'll notice the blind side of person get kind of sad if the person's smiling you'll notice the blind side of person smile a little bit too and they don't know why they're smiling they don't know why they're getting sad but their brain is able to pick up enough information because it can see, I guess it can see enough but you're not able to perceive that you are seeing Maybe that makes some sense to you. I think it helps me understand how this whole whole thing works. Um, here's the blind spot experiment. If you define the blind spot, you draw a filled in quarter inch size square in a circle. It's kind of like this, three or four inches apart on a piece of paper. The next step here is that you'd hold the paper at arm's length and you'd close your eyes, okay? And then close your left eye and then you'd focus on the square with your right eye so the square is on the opposite side focus on the square with your right eye and you'd slowly move the paper towards you when the circle reaches your blind spot it'll disappear the square will disappear I think that's what they were saying um, try again to find the blind spot for your other eyes so you'd close your right eye focus on the circle with your left eye you would move the paper until the square disappeared Excuse me. What happened when the circle disappeared, or the square? In the second example, did you see nothing where the circle had been? No. When the circle disappeared, you saw a plain white background that matched the rest of the sheet of paper. It's still there, but you don't see it. That's because your brain filled in for the blind spot. Your eye didn't send any information about that part of the paper because it's hitting the blind spot. So the brain made a made the whole match the rest. So you're going to see white instead of seeing red or black or nothing. Um, you can try the experiment on a piece of colored paper and you'll see whatever color matches the rest of the paper. So that'll give you an example of how to do that. It's pretty interesting. Some of these experiments are, are pretty awesome, but to give you a sense to like, give you a chance to, to sense and to perceive what's actually happening. So let's talk fovea. Um, this is the central point in the retina, as we've mentioned, and around which the eye's cones uh, cluster. So lots of cones. Because of this, there is little color vision in the furthest periphery of our vision. So we're in a rod-free area, as they say. And I've got a, a, a deal pointing down to it here. Cones in the fovea. Now there are rods around it, but there are no... Um, these are rods down here there are no rods in this fovea area. So you get a sense of see where it is. The fovea is, fovea is, fovea is here and this little notch in there, okay? The optic disc, <clears throat> fovea, maybe in a way that you can see it over here that it actually looks like that when you look into the eye. You can see it, like, it looks like a little indentation or a dot. Okay, the retina. 
The light sensitive inner surface of the eye contains the receptor rods and the cones plus layers of other neurons like bipolar and ganglion cells which we're going to look at here in a second. They process the visual information. So along the back of the eye is where the retina is and you've got the optic nerve there that things are leading into. So how do these neurons work to get that signals, those signals passed um, into the brain? Well, here is a good example. It's probably more detailed than you need, but it's a good example of the cellular organization of the retina. It says at the top there, retinal pigment, and then you've got rods and cones, outer nuclear layer, outer plexiform layer, inner, all that's nice. It just gives you the layers over here on the right. This is telling you what these are. So the blue things are rods. The cones are red, green, blue. Gives you some idea that that's cone is color. Color, cone. That's the best way to remember it for your, for your test. The outer limiting membrane. Okay, there's membranes here. There are horizontal cells. That's great. We're going to focus on the bipolar cells, which you can see many rods attached to one bipolar cell but every uh, every cone is attached to its own bipolar cell and then we've got ganglion cells along the bottom here and the ganglion cells pass that information on then to um, the optic nerve so another way of looking at this is the photoreceptor cells rods and cones rods are blue there on the left cones are on the right and you can see kind of cones have kind of a cone shape to it and a rod is more like a rod shape but the outer segment contains photosensitive uh, chemicals on both cases and then you can see the nucleus as well. Rods are the peripheral of the retina. They detect black, white, and gray and twilight or low light is very important for rods. So if you're having if you have an issue with rods in your retina maybe you're gonna have a, a essentially difficult or especially difficult problems seeing when there's low light Cones are near the center of the retina and they have fine detail, really, really fine detail and color vision. So daylight or well-lit conditions will be um, using cones. Another way to look at it here, just another couple of ways to focus in on it. Um, the, at the top it says the retina contains two types of photoreceptors, rods and cones. And rods blue here. Um, rods are more numerous, 120 million or so, and are more sensitive than cones. Um, however, they're not sensitive to color. So, in the green at the bottom there, there are six to seven million cones, much less, many more rods than cones. The cones are going to provide the color sensitivity for the eye, and they are much more concentrated in the central yellow spot known as the macula. You don't need to know that, but just so you understand um, if you're looking through it in another way. But in the center of the region, which is the fovea centralis is this really tiny spot where we looked at it before it's a rod free area with a very thin densely packed cones all right photoreceptor cells another way of looking at rods and cones I've got the same information there on the left but let's look at the differences here in number rods have many 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 more in location you've got the rods in the periphery the cones in the center color sensitive cones is color color cones light sensitivity that's your rods now I think of it this way like a rod is like a flashlight so if it's low light I don't know I think of a rod or a long flashlight um, handle I don't know what that means but there's got to be a way to remember these right um, ability to detect detail color is detail right and if there's not an ability in the rods to, to really see color, uh, that makes sense that it would be low. And here's an important point, the number of bipolar cells. So cones each have their own bipolar cell, which we're going to look at here in a second. And rods share one with other rods. Now maybe a good way to remember this is that the cones are sending on color and they need their own bipolar cell to send a very good color uh, def definition of what color is. So these bipolar cells are the cells and rod that rods and cones send messages through and they send them through to the ganglion cells. So let's look at bipolar here. They receive messages from the photoreceptor cells 
and they transmit them to the ganglion. And you can see it at the top right here too. So here are your photoreceptor cells, rods and cones. Cone in this example is kind of a, a yellowish, maybe like a ice cream cone. And the rods are purple. You can see that the cone has its own bipolar cell and then it leads on to the ganglion cells. Now there are other connections here. Um, we're not going to worry about that right now, but these are the main ones. So which what does the ganglion cells do? They, um, ha they form the optic nerve with the axons and they send signals into the brain to the visual cortex or as we've mentioned the occipital lobe. So remember cones have their own bipolar cells and you can see that there. There's the cones bipolar cell they're singled up. Multiple rods will share one bipolar cell. Okay, now this isn't hugely important for our test in class but for the AP test there may be a question where they're gonna say something along of an FRQ that talks about vision. Ganglion, bipolar, rods, cones, it could definitely be on there. Maybe they're, it could, you know, we're gonna see a bunch of examples in class, but just don't sleep on this stuff. It's better to learn it all and focus back in on the target sheets and see what you can understand from there. Let's look a little bit more here and then I'm gonna stop this video. We'll do a part two on vision just to keep it a little bit quicker but and a little shorter, but light enters the eye and triggers photochemical reaction in the rods and cones in the back of the retina. Chemical reaction in turn activates the bipolar cells like we saw in the last clip there. Then the third part happens, the bipolar cells activate the ganglion cells. The axons then con converge to form into the optic nerve and you can see it here, the neural impulse. You get the light coming in and then it kind of comes back off and then down through into um, the optic nerve which will lead to the visual cortex. This nerve transmits information to the visual cortex of the brain's occipital lobe. So we've mentioned many times this is why we do vision and sensation and perception with the biological base of behavior. There's so much of it that's tied together we might as well learn it in tandem. When we come back, we'll do feature detection and we'll look at color theories as well. So part two of this, I'm going to take a break here and we'll come back with um, part two of vision in just a minute.